kind of constant over time and that may be interesting um, to, to mention, as well as a few observations, um, more recent developments and, and trends uh, that I think I'm, I'm, I'm seeing here on, on the horizon. Um, and so if, if I continue here, let me see, oops, now the controls are back. So um, where do I come from? And um, so, one second, I'm, I'm still having some issues here with my back and forth, so now it's good. Um, so where did I come from? I'm, I'm a physicist uh, by training and, and that, that influenced me a lot. So let me tell you a little bit why I like data so much and um, uh, analysis of big amounts of data. So when I, when I started um, studying towards the part when you do your master thesis, so the last two years of my studies, I was lucky and could go to CERN. CERN is in Geneva. It's the biggest accelerator you, you will find on earth. And as a matter of fact, it was just about the time when this huge machine was, was being launched uh, into operation back then under the name of um, Large Electron Positron Collider. And this is a huge 27 kilometer circumference device about more than hundred meters below surface. So everything for me as a young student there was, was gigantic, right? So starting with this huge machine, then going on and here I'm showing now the upgrade that, that it received like 10 years after it, it started working as a, a lab. It, it was called Large Hadron Collider. And there were huge experiments that are placed under Earth, uh, under the surface. And, and these huge machines, you see a little bit here, perhaps uh, the dimensions compared to, to us humans. So these are huge machines. Think about it as microscopes, and 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 they are there to collect uh, tons of data, and that data is then what will be analyzed later on. And um, so, what is then, of course, also gigantic is the amount of data that is generated in such an environment, um, and and so you have something like two billion of these proton-proton collisions, head-on collisions per second, and that just generates crazy amounts of data, right? So. Um, yeah, that was huge. Um, of course, then all the computing you need is huge. Um, I don't know, a few of you may remember that name of the Cray supercomputer. Today, you would probably put an iPhone and it would do probably the same job. But that was, was a big uh, computer back then. So that was a certain approach um, um, in an architecture that was in vogue. And CERN was the first place where you would find that in Europe. And it was also the first place where it would be decommissioned because um, they definitely went uh, in, in, into other architectures like farms of, um, you know, of Unix machines and then the servers and so on and so on. And of course, overwhelming the physics. That's why I was there. So understanding more about um, the Big Bang, right? So what were the conditions? We had a model, the standard model, and so on and so on. So this, this is all the, the story. And I really just wanted to give you that kind of background, see you know, what has motivated me to really work very early on in this um, AI space. So I started off uh, working on expert systems. So that was kind of a paradigm, um, kind of from symbolic AI that was uh, on vogue back then. After earlier on, Marvin Minsky had shown that uh, using simple, what they call perceptrons, so not yet the, you know, the neural networks as we know them, but these were simpler um, architectures, they couldn't even solve simple problems such as the XOR problem. So that got, you know, that kind of neural network research into a longer period of darkness or standby. So I was happy working on, on these um, at CERN, you know, doing diagnostics of, of, of certain faults of, of complex machines. So that was an interesting approach to learn. And then of course, very quickly after um, I switched to neural networks, which came in vogue again after someone else proved that, well, if you have nonlinear neurons, you can model almost anything. You know, you just have to have enough, enough neurons in your, in your um, deep learning model. So um, there were many applications I could start then playing with, you know, be it for particle track reconstruction using different setups or identifying certain uh, fundamental particles. Um, so all of that um, was, you know, back then you had to write your own code. So um, we didn't have the open, open source libraries, which came a bit later. So that takes a bit of time until you get uh, something deployed. As I moved out of academia, when I finished my PhD, um, it was pretty much about um, already then automating 
um, you know, the whole operation of model production and operation um, and replacement of models by new models and massive amounts of models, hundreds of different models um, that would be live um, and automated. So this was something that we started very early on in the, in, in the 2000s. And I think this is still, you know, today a topic under, uh, you know, auto ML and, and, and these are kind of the, the tags that we have today. But in fact, that was a work uh, on my side that started very early on. And then it moved more and more into measuring also the value, really proving the value of, of AI, of AI applications. So um, you, you can prove it through A-B testing, depending on the applications where you come from, that may be more difficult in a B2B uh, context, for instance. And then today, I think a very important, this, this product focus, everything is a product, uh, AI product, and that brings automatically the customer, um, the user into the focus and quality with it. So I think we, we get more and more that um, very good focus on, uh, on quality. So now summarizing, looking back uh, from, from my experience at Leeds, what, what are the things that I think stayed constant over time? And these may be interesting for you here and there to, you know, to have a look into. Um, so one of the unfortunate evergreens and constants I found at least is data quality, uh, which is a pity because we, 20, 30 years ago, I would have told you, yeah, I waste 90% of my time resolving these data issues. And today the answer is more or less the same. So I think we, we still haven't gotten out of that um, uh, or removed that big barrier for scaling up um, AI. Um, this of course limits the productivity of our AI teams or data science teams, analytics teams, industrialization is slowed down or even impossible. And uh, of course the value finally that we can get out of um, AI is greatly limited by that. So I'm happy to hear about also others uh, here in the audience, you know, what, what your experience is. Then on the scale side, yes, um, if we want to create um, advanced uh, applications that contain some AI uh, components, we need to understand what, what is that business, of course, that we're working for. So how does that work? How does it generate value? Um, what are the, the pain points? Uh, not always easy to identify. How are the stakeholders and incentivized and, and, and what are the value metrics that we should be defining and measuring? Um, and I think also not to be underestimated is of course the organizational change that it, that it implies. It may often be a barrier uh, for adopting AI is just the change that it would um, uh, imply. And usually in, you know, adopting AI based uh, innovation means change of the current way of working. Um, that's um, very much true in most cases. On the technical side of skills, of course, we expect that um, you know the the stakeholder or the the people who develop those solutions solutions that they have very good uh, and deep data science skills, uh, depending on the area you're working on. Um, so we need to have some continuous learning. We need to be up to date with what's going on on the AI front, which is developing very quickly. But I think also you need that kind of experimental. A scientific approach to to cut bigger problems into pieces, formulate hypothesis, and so on and so on, um, and visualization definitely another uh, important ingredient. More on the I, I call it IT uh, in quotes. Let's say skills. Um, there's all the other technical um, skills we need. You need to have some some good knowledge of, of programming languages today. More and more cloud architectures and so on. Uh, be you know being capable of working with different um, advanced analytics tools. Um, but I think it should not um, make us blind to you know in the sense of it's not all about orbitating around technology. Technology is the enabler, but what we're really trying to do is solve problems. And that is at the center and uh, not the technology uh, from my perspective. One thing we may, um, or I've seen several times, is of course, that when we, you know, we build these models, we almost fall in love with them and we want them to be perfect. That most likely will never happen. Um, so sometimes it's really better to, um, have a reasonable model that works reasonably well. Let's get it out there. It starts generating some value and let's keep optimizing it afterwards. Um, 
So that, that would be a recommendation. Then the other topic um, I've been, um, of course, observing um, is interdisciplinarity. And here I'm just showing a few uh, profiles. Um, this may change according to the area you're working in, of course, you, you will have different personas participating in this. Um, but you know, to give an example, so we have the business side uh, represented, uh, usually um, wants to minimize the risk while maximizing the return. So that's uh, the, the balance act that, uh, that they're usually working on. Uh, on the more like data scientist slash AI side, well, we do all these experiments, we try models, uh, you know that very well. Things can go wrong anytime, but that's part of the game and we keep generating knowledge, which then uh, is usually uh, put into practice uh, and production by more of the engineering um, uh, people that, that contribute uh, to this whole uh, project or, or activity uh, that you may be working on. So um, I think this, this complementarity is very important. So each, have, each of these have a different way of working and together that really makes uh, a lot of sense. Some words about um, soft skills. Um, definitely one topic that I have observed is, um, you know, if you are so, um, you just see that the innovation is working greatly. There's many things you can do. You can, you can go very far ahead. And by doing that, you may forget, um, perhaps that other people will not follow you at the same speed. And it may be worth slowing down a bit the pace of innovation, because otherwise you will find yourself alone running ahead and, and, and nobody behind you. So um, the other thing um, I, I put here, ability to network. So I think it's very important that um, you know, we as data scientists, as, as AI specialists, that we we, we know what's going on, we, we make ourselves known, but that we also understand a network, um, you know, with all different areas of, um, of the companies, of the organizations, in a little bit of role of an internal consultant, um, always looking for opportunities, uh, usually, um, and uh, trying to identify the right or the real pain points by asking the right questions. And that is not always easy. It's very often I find even close almost to an art because the real problems um, from my experience, they're behind many layers of apparent problems uh, until you get to them. Um, and then finally, if you tell a story, a success story about AI being employed here and there, uh, definitely you need to do that in, in, in your stakeholders language and not in a very technical um, language, uh, which is, usually not, not very much um, appreciated. Then, um, of course, you will have to, to find the people that have the skills to create your, um, your AI applications, uh, solutions. Um, that will always be a challenge, I guess. Uh, there will never be enough data scientists. And among those, you still have to find the ones that are the, the right talents for, for what you are up to, uh, to do. Um, and then, of course, the next thing is once you have hired a certain, uh, you know, the, the talents that you were looking for, how do you retain them? Because that's the next challenge. Um, usually the market being very hot, um, you know, what is it that is really retaining them? And from my perspective, it's very much about the interesting challenges you can provide um, um, to be resolved. So if these are really challenging, high value adding, I think then uh, you have a good chance of retaining them. And um, then the next thing is, how do you make that team efficient, right? So that we don't just do research in any kind of direction, but really pointing towards uh, generation of value. Interdisciplinary um, teams, I mentioned that before. The last point here I would make is about the kind of leadership um, that I've seen over the years, also myself as I learn, um, I see much more benefits in a, in a kind of a, a pool leadership, which is more kind of a, a, a servant um, manager kind of um, um, approach than pushing uh, into the teams what you think they should be doing. Uh, I think rather better that they follow you because you have a certain proposition to make that uh, sounds interesting. 
And um, coming towards the end, um, a few notes on recent developments um, that I've been observing, and I'm sure you, you see them as well. Um, one of the things um, over the years um, that I find interesting and absolutely correct also is the development that we, I think in the beginning, it was very much about um, AI, machine learning, simply replacing people in what they're doing. And I think that focus is now shifting more and more, definitely in the area where I am, in, in, into augmenting our capabilities um, and also making our jobs more interesting um, by the help of, of AI that, that empowers us. Um, another topic that I, I really stumbled across over the last years is really the point, sometimes we ask, so why can't we really scale up AI in a bigger way? Data quality is certain one, but the other is, I think, the purely organizational barriers. And I think part of that is also middle management, which is largely not yet ready to adopt um, AI on, on a large scale. So you may end up doing many great projects. You can show value, but in the end, nothing will change. Uh, the, the, the new ways of working will not, not be adopted. Um, and, and that I see as a little bit of a barrier. Um, so we need to enable many more people to really start using data themselves and become more data driven. Um, I think the tools are around, the, the reservation I would have is still um, the data quality side. As long as we have those issues, I guess you get more trouble than benefits if you have everyone doing auto ML on any kind of um, suspicious data. So this must go hand in hand, um, you know, before we can unlock the value of data really. And regulations, I guess they, they continue to increase. So we're seeing a lot um, coming up already out there uh, uh, that will certainly continue growing. Uh, so I think we need to be uh, ready and embrace it. Um, and uh, industrialization, standardization, automation of AI definitely as well. And uh, to close, um, you've seen some of that, certainly um, the MLOps concepts, you know, that we augment or increase the, the, the well-known DevOps approach to also contain the, the continuous exploration using uh, ML and AI methods um, are, are part of this. And we also have some architectures, uh, frameworks that are being um, described and proposed. Uh, just an example here from, from Google which I find quite um, useful, of course, now without going into any, any details here. Um, in the ways of working, the agile and the scaled agile, I think also uh, good movements here that um, you know, have a product centric um, and, and team empowering kind of focus. Um, so I think all in all, uh, very desirable uh, developments. And, uh, and finally, on the data front, I, I see some hope there. So there is um, the fair data uh, movement that you may have seen already. Um, I think that is already addressing some data quality dimensions, hopefully also putting data quality more into the center of attention. And another movement that I'm observing uh, that is creating that kind of attention on data is this kind of data as a product approach that we see in the data mesh um, context since 2019, more or less. So I see some adoption of those uh, principles. I've just brought here, you know, what are the kind of requirements um, or product properties uh, for these data products? And many of them, of course, they, they, are, they are related to data quality. So let's hope that this um, brings the desired effect and good data, plenty of good data so that we could um, generate plenty of good um, applications using AI in future. Thanks for your attention. This is all I, I had for you today. Thank you. Happy to take some questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for sharing the presentation. Thank you. Now, just we have time for Q&A. Uh, we have given uh, possibility of microphone camera on to all participants before launch. So anybody who has a question, please just switch on the camera. So I, I, we have just a feedback from Niraj, uh, Ibsen Pharmaceuticals, excellent presentation, Frank. Thanks a lot, we Thank agree the same. So 
Anati token, okay. Marcos, 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 start with a question. Hi, Frank. Thank you very much for this interesting insights and based on your long term experience. You mentioned one point that uh, data scientists is a shortage. They're not enough on the market to fulfill all the demand of companies. And how do you see the possibilities of self service analytics to fill up a little bit this gap and uh, let's say get the um, the demand of uh, knowledge workers closer to the uh, situation of missing data scientists yeah no thank, thanks for the question marcus and, and this is uh, spot on right the, the, i mean we, we have those talks about the citizen data scientists um i think the idea is great the only dependence i would see or the restriction is the data quality so, I mean, you have great tools, you know, tools like yours and others that, that provide those kind of easy access to data preparation and data analysis and, and ML. I think the tools are there. Now we need to make sure that the data is also there and good because otherwise you will have many people um, that start using the data and they will get contradictory results. And then you get a lot of discussion everywhere uh, and then in the end, they will even say it's the tool, right? Um, which is not, of course, uh, the case. So that is my only restriction. Um, you know, as soon as you have areas of data where you say, this is safe, we have, you know, we can guarantee the quality of that. I think then you can open it up for, you know, business users uh, to widely start working on that. Thank you very much, Frank. No, thank you. Thanks a lot. And now there was somebody else, Hannah Tukon. If you have any question, you can switch on microphone as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Frank. Uh, interesting talk. Uh, because I think uh, I want to ask a relevant question is like, uh, because what we are facing is we are facing a huge amount of data. And of course, data quality and governance is important. But then, uh, and some people will emphasize too much on this. And uh, this will slow down the, let's say, uh, driving the insights. So we're in this dilemma is like, uh, because actually uh, the huge amount of data, what type of insights uh, we should focus on, what type of insights comes first, or uh, let's clean up all the data. But this, we don't know, this cleaning up the data is a huge, tedious, very time consuming work. And uh, insight driven is of course more welcome from the business end. Uh, I mean, what is the balance there? Just yeah. as Thanks um, for, for the question. I think that's exactly, you know, the, the complicated situation we're, we're in. And, you know, we as data scientists, well, we work in this environment and we would never say, let's wait until all the data is fixed and then we start working. That's just not feasible. So very often also our work, I mean, our productivity goes down because we have to fight against these data quality uh, problems. At the same, same time, as we do this work, we also understand certain, um, you know, we get data intelligence, which can then be used again to nicely model it subsequently into a data mesh, data product, uh, a data lake, whatever. But we can, we also provide help to those people who then, you know, make data nice, right, in the end. But very often we are at the forefront of this, right? So yeah, we, we cannot wait, we need to move on, but wouldn't it be great if we could move on like three times faster? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Jack? Yeah. Um, hi, Frank. Nice to see you again. See you um, there. You mentioned at the end moving into production. So what, what do you have kind of top two learnings when you move from this prototyping MVPs to production? And, and what do you need to take into account? And, and, and what's your learnings uh, in that journey? No, great, great question. And, and uh, you know, what we are working um, um, very much on is, is to shorten that time. You know, we, we're very good in, in prototyping um, and shorten the time from prototype to production or to product, right? And this, mm -hmm. it could still be that after three, four months, we have a prototype, but then it takes another nine months or so to get the product out, and it's too long. And so we are now also trying to work on certain platforms, which then would allow us more of a seamless path from idea to prototype, 
to production. So, uh, you know, many uh, products out there and definitely we, we looked into some data science workbenches and we're getting some benefits from there. So this is something that we're really uh, ramping up strongly now. So I think time to production is, uh, is key. Um, yeah, I would say that's the major learning.